very happy to have Margaret Bendroth with us today from the Congregational Library in Boston. She's also a historian. She has a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins, and she's done most of her work on early American and modern American religious traditions, <coughs> particularly the connection to faith and history. And I encountered her via a book, her book, Spiritual Practice of Remembering, which I have a crush on, so I recommend <laughs> everyone read it, and I require students to read it in as many classes as where I can make it fit the curriculum in any possible way. So as someone who doesn't do religious history or American history, that's not always easy, but I make it work. Um, because it's uh, about the connection between knowing about the past and practicing faith in the present. Um, but she's also written extensively about Puritan religious practice, both contempor contemporary and um, historical. I like the title of your most recent book, The Last Puritans. Um, so we're happy to have her here. I know many of you have probably read Spiritual Practice of Remembering um, and know her work. She will speak today and then tomorrow she'll also do a more casual Q&A more geared for students thinking about careers in history that aren't necessarily being a professor, since that's the only people you see here. There are other opportunities out there. Um, she'll speak for maybe 30, 40 minutes and then have time for question and answer um, here today. So welcome with me, Margaret Bendroth. Well, thanks very much um, for this wonderfully kind invitation. Uh, to get out of Boston, which was beastly cold when I left. It's much balmier here, um, and it's uh, also quite beautiful. Uh, and so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you on a subject you know that I, that I care about, and I know that you care about too. So I've uh, entitled this lecture, New Life from Old Stories, Faith and Scholarship in Anxious Times. And I'm going to begin with one of my childhood memories, one of my sharpest, sweetest, and most infamous childhood memories is the annual grade school picnic and what happened there. I loved that picnic immoderately. Uh, and what child wouldn't? We, after, yeah, and, the, and I grew up in upstate New York, so dreary months of rain and snow and spelling books, and then they let us loose in a park for a few hours of absolute freedom. Uh, in retrospect, as I think about it as an adult, I think the teachers just kind of temporarily gave up on us uh, because they just let us run wild. At any rate, my memory of this picnic is um, tromping through the woods with my friends, uh, uh, over hills, uh, over dale, and not a grown up in sight anywhere. Even when our parents arrived with hot dogs and hamburgers, it was not all that hard to lose track of them completely. Inevitably, we all wound up in a Rondequoit Creek. Rondequoit Creek was dirty and slow. It was fairly shallow. It was a little bit smelly. Um, and absolutely ideal for anything that had to do with mud. I would completely lose track of myself in Arundacoit Creek. I was swept up in this incredible fun. And I, and I have this memory, and maybe you have one like this, well, I'll just take my shoes off and I'll just wade a little bit. Uh, and then I decided that, you know, a little water isn't going to hurt my shorts and my t-shirt. And then before I knew it, I was up to my neck and I was swimming in Arundacoit Creek. And every year, I would set out determined not to let this happen. And every year, it would. Like clockwork, my parents would find me, probably grab me by the nape of the neck, uh, and let me know that they were not pleased. My mother, I remember, was absolutely mortified. And she made sure I knew that. And so my memory of this picnic ends with very long car rides home. Uh, sitting in the back seat with my sisters and brothers, dripping wet, smelling like creek water, in disgrace and completely puzzled. And every year I would promise that this will never happen again. I don't know how it did, but next year I am not going to let this happen. And perhaps you've had an experience like this yourself um, as a scholar, as a student, 
being wrong, finding yourself off the track, and no idea how you got there. Um, it can be terrifying, but as, uh, I, as I was thinking about this and reflecting on this, I do betray my age and saying it really doesn't bother me as much as it uh, used to. Um, I, know, I remember when my mother reached the age where she just was going to say what she was going to say and no one was going to stop her. I'm almost there. Don't worry, not quite though. Um, in all honestly, uh, honesty, I'm at that stage of life where it's really kind of okay to be spectacularly out of sync. Not all the time, um, but definitely from time to time. And I believe that that's a good thing for anyone who's living the life of the mind and the spirit. It's an opportunity to embrace the world from an unsettling, unsettled, untethered perspective. You know, I had a friend who, um, whose backyard um, faced the New Jersey Turnpike. And he used to go out into his backyard and do batting practice hour after hour because he was convinced that at some moment, a scout from the New York Yankees would be driving down the New Jersey Turnpike um, and would spot this young man with his incredible uh, baseball skills uh, and come running with a contract. You never know. At a certain point, you know, it's no longer necessary. This is true for aging athletes, but also for scholars. Um, and I would add for anyone who wants to practice the craft of scholarship, of, of history, um, within a faith perspective. The anxiety to produce, to be the best, to win the argument. At some point, we all kind of have to make peace with the hand that's been dealt to us. The long haul, I, I can say, is longer and more forgiving than any of us think. That doesn't mean that our work is easier. These are anxious and ugly times, as I'm sure you know. I don't think I need to run a list of all the things um, that there are to worry about, all the things that are teetering. There's more reason than ever to wonder whether it's possible or even permissible to explore the world of the past, to write and think and teach about it when we are all in so much trouble today. Does the world really need another historian, another scholar? I do think so. I think so emphatically, but not maybe in the way that we're accustomed to. So my remarks this afternoon are some reflections on why I study history, how I study history, more how than why, I think, and how my faith commitments require um, a calm interior focus and a deep sense of urgency. And so, you know, I hope we'll have some time to hear um, your thoughts about this as well, because we're all kind of trying to do a lot of the same things. So back in 1997, the prize-winning historian George Marsden published a book, and it was called The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship. That was not all that long ago, 1997. Probably some of you weren't born, but that's OK. Um, but in many ways, it was <clears throat> very long ago. Many paradigms passed. This was when many people who called themselves Christian scholars um, saw themselves as an embattled minority, um, a pariah group within an overwhelmingly secular, sometimes openly hostile academic world. You know, they contended against this assumption that anyone with a religious perspective was, uh, you know, was not an objective thinker, that, they, that this was a form of distortion. Um, I heard the phrase that you're, you know, you're putting a grid on reality and only seeing it through, those, through that grid. Uh, and, you know, I, I may not look that old, but when I was in graduate school, um, this was still okay to say that. This is kind of before you know postmodern perspectives came in, and so um, uh, people uh, uh, in 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 my program and the professors were all about objectivity. Well, we just see the facts and we read them and we understand them and we write about them. But you religious people, you can't do that. It was a really interesting time for me because you're like. 
No, your perspective is that you don't have a perspective. <laughs> um, and so it, it made for strange bedfellows uh, in my department at Hopkins. So um, the people who were kind of friends and allies, there was actually another LDS uh, grad student. There was me. There was a Marxist. And then there was um, an Israeli ex-paratrooper who was passionately interested in the New England Puritans. We all kind of banded together because you have perspectives. We don't. Well, that's all changed. You know, Marsden made this kind of outrageous argument that people of faith deserved a place at the table along with everybody else. If the um, postmodern academy was open to scholarship based on gender, race, sexuality, you know, I write as a historian of women, uh, and only I can do that because of what I understand of being a woman. Well, then why, if we are going to allow those perspectives, Marsden said, why not religion? Why not Christianity or Islam or Buddhism? Why should religion be the one category that's automatically excluded from, you know, diversity? Now, this outrageous proposition um, garnered its share of criticism. A lot of people took issue that you, you know, were equating religion with uh, gender, race, and sexuality. It didn't convince everyone, but in the long run, it really won out. Um, at, at, at any rate, um, religion is no longer a, a shameful subject for scholars to practice in the academy. It's misunderstood, it's trivialized, but it's not as radioactive as it was when I was in graduate school. In, in fact, you know, it's one of the fastest areas, uh, growing areas of concentration in American history. So e even talking about your own personal religion in the secular academic world is now kind of OK. And some of the top scholars, Carlos Ayer, Robert Orsi, people like this, are talking about their personal experiences growing up, their personal um, belief system, their encounters with miracles. Um, it's all there, and it's OK. Um, so part of what I'm going to say is my own perspective, working uh, as, as um, uh, Professor Harris said, I don't work in the academic world now. I did. I was a professor of history for six very long years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I direct a, a, a library and archive now, so my life is very different. But I still write and read and go to conferences and write books and, and all those other kinds of wonderful things. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm been aware of how the agenda has shifted. We have a new challenge now that it's, a, it's more okay. How do we stay outrageous? How do people of faith doing scholarship, now that you're not out there kind of scary and, and don't fit in, how do you stay outrageous? What happens next? What distinguishes a scholar with a faith perspective? You know, it's no longer just that you take religion seriously in your research and writing. Lots of people do now. Um, what difference does faith make now? Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I just one example off the bat that really comes home to me all the time. Um, back when George Marsden wrote that book about outrageous scholarship, he had to also urge people who had been kind of in a religious ghetto to go out and swim in the pool with a big fish, you know, to play by the rules of the profession, to learn and write and talk about their beliefs without using theological jargon or religious buzzwords. You wanted to kind of be part of, uh, don't go out of the way, he said, to make yourself conspicuous. And that advice, you know, to go in and swim and be you know, be part of the secular academy, that served him and a lot of his colleagues really well. I mean, they're famous, they are winning prizes, they're spinning off graduate students who win prizes. And so in, in many ways, these, you know, Marsden and other evangelical historians I know have really, um, uh, really managed to, you know, play by the rules and do it better than a lot of people. But now I say, you know, maybe it's time for us to think about breaking some rules. And by that I mean, especially for those of us in the room who are in our scholars in the academy, it means 
uh, transgressing the unwritten rules that every graduate student learns, that the higher ups must never seek the company of the lower downs, people with less prestigious posts or milder uh, accomplishments. You should not hang out with people who don't have as you know, prestigious a uh, resume as you do and so forth. Um, Scholars are taught to be selfish, you know, to use our uh, intellectual capital selfishly, to punish people who are not as smart or as hardworking or perceptive or gifted as we think we are. Now, it's really important in the scholarly world to have standards and rigorous back and take and uh, back and forth and uh, critique. But you know, I've known people, and I count myself as one of them who carry a disdainful remark or a bad review with them for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, you know, one of the greatest gifts my advisor ever gave me was returning my every page of my dissertation completely covered with editorial marks. He, it was black with pencil, because he was teaching me how to write, how to think, you know, he was very frank when I said something, you know, he would just write no in the <laughs> margin. Uh, and that is a great gift. He took me seriously, but he was never cruel about it. Uh, and I think that Christian scholars, in a way, we can, there's a different way of being professional that we can model. But the larger point that I want to make is about the actual craft. And many of you are learning this craft of being a historian, uh, or you've been practicing it. Not so much uh, how we position our and talk about our religious commitments, but how we actually do the work itself. In what sense can scholarship be a spiritual discipline, what the, the, the monks called a rule of life? You know, in a monastic community, um, the rule of life took the everyday and the mundane, and it gave it spiritual purpose and significance. It meant pursuing rhythms of prayer and meditation and worship and work, all of a piece, doing those daily tasks with an, a deep sense of their eternal meaning and importance, not just for you, but for the world. Um, and so in what way can our work be that rule of life, a spiritual discipline? Now, most of us do not think of a scholarly article or a scholarly book as a thing of beauty. In fact, the crunchier, the duller, the more factual, the better. You know, we're, if our work is a little scary for amateurs, we like that. You know, we're not here to entertain. But I would say, why not just a little? Why not write in a way that engages people's imaginations in their hearts as well as their minds. We are all, if you're a historian, you're a writer. Uh, that's what you do pretty much every day. Um, uh, maybe we are not the latest incarnation of Ernest Hemingway, uh, maybe more prose than poetry, but we are people who like to sound out the subtleties of words, discovering the rhythms of phrase. Why limit art and creativity to a favored few? You know, there's no accrediting agency that says who can call themselves an artist or try to create something beautiful, not just novelists and poets and painters. Of course, writing is very hard work. Uh, and just like every artistic pursuit, it's hard work. You can't sit and wait for the inspiration fairy to hit you with her magic wand uh, when you're searching for your next point in a book or an essay. It's a craft. Writing is a craft, like building a house, chipping marble to make a statue, training your dog to sit. It means that you choose every word with care. Uh, you rearrange and rearrange paragraphs so that they're in the right order. Uh, and you stick to it until it looks and feels right. If, it, if you're like me, it's a, a mighty struggle for every topic sentence in a paragraph, every transition. But it's really worth it to think of your writing as your craft. Uh, uh, I used to teach a history methods class, and um, I know my students were all rolling their eyes on the day that I did footnotes, because I just couldn't contain myself. Um, I still believe that a footnote placed in just the right spot 
with the right information is intensely satisfying. You know, a footnote can be a vanity project. You know, make sure everybody knows how well read you are and uh, how many arcane subjects you can bring together. But uh, your footnote also demonstrates to your readers what fascinated you. You know, the rabbit holes that you investigated willingly for days, if not weeks. And sometimes, I hate to say this, but for the sake of one really good sentence, um, footnotes signify a community of scholars whose ideas matter to us. And I think if they're used properly, they could be downright elegant. I know, I don't, can't convince everyone, but, and I know I didn't convince my students, but I love footnotes. Um, and goodness knows, we need elegance and grace. We don't need to burden the world with clunky prose, dense jargon that even we don't understand arguments that we've constructed to use the evidence that we have, um, not really what idea that we're pursuing. I, I say this because, you know, I work at a, a library and a lot of the people that, um, you know, I, I work with scholars, but we have scholars come in and talk about their books. And uh, to mostly lay people, non-professional historians. And I've watched many scholars talking to a room full of people about deconstructing, constructing, negotiating, all this postmodern jargon and all that, not realizing that they're defeating their own purpose. These people are not stupid. They're not uneducated, but they are not there to talk postmodern theory. They want to hear a story about another person. Uh, to encounter another human being, bottom line, to hear another person's stories, story. So good writing is an act of respect and kindness, but it's also, I would say, um, an act of principled resistance. Now you're gonna have to stay with me here. How you say what you say matters. And this is a wonderful book by a woman named Marilyn McIntyre, and it's called Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies. She describes what she calls the spiritual practice of precision. Writing well, she says, requires a certain kind of humility, a monitoring of yourself. You know, our world is full of all kinds of imprecision cliches and generalizations and abstractions, jargon, sentimentality, passive constructions, hyperbole. Um, but precision, writing about it, using the exact right words that you want, being absolutely clear about what you're saying, requires attentive, uh, attentiveness and effort. It's not about swinging for the rhetorical fences every time you're up at bat, but acute, what she says, attention to progress, an awareness of what your words are doing in that cultural moment. And need I say, you know, all you have to do uh, and, uh, is reference, you know, how difficult it has begun become for us to talk about truth and alternative facts and uh, different interpretations. We're, we really need, um, a, 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 in this cultural moment, a, a sense of, of, of saying, being truthful. So choosing just the right verb, using a concrete noun rather than a euphemism, that goes beyond the rules of good grammar. When in our world, when so much of what we read has been put together by a marketing strategist, an attention getting banner, uh, you know, promising breaking news, the quiet, clearly articulated, subtle truth is a countercultural protest. Now, it may feel like wasted time in the world that we're living in. Uh, in our, our world of moral uh, emergency, but I see it as fighting back. And, I, and here, um, I quote you something from Leonard Bernstein, the famous composer, uh, conductor, who, and this was what he said back in the wake of the Kennedy assassination um, in 1963. Uh, this is Leonard Bernstein. We musicians, he's writing to musicians, but we can listen in. We musicians, like everyone else, are numb with sorrow at this murder and with rage at the senselessness of the crime. But this sorrow and rage will not inflame us to seek 
retribution. Rather, he said, they will inflame our art. Our music will never be quite the same. This will be our reply to violence, to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. Now, some of this, you know, what I'm saying may seem obvious, I hope, uh, not completely arcane, but I think it's really important that we talk about the historian's craft in this world of social media. Uh, and I know, I'm a baby boomer, but uh, I do know what the Facebook and the Twitter are. Um, um, and, and, and of course, I use them. Uh, I have children. And in a lot of ways, social media is a huge gift to the scholarly world. It's uh, how you get news out about your new book, a great article that you came across you want other people to read, and of course, all that humble bragging about various accomplishments. I am so honored that I have been, yeah, and so. But of course, um, the social media is also great for distraction. I mean, who, who wouldn't love, uh, just a minute, you know, who liked my post? Uh, what's the president or my cousin in Milwaukee or all those cats? What are they up to? Um, so social media is great, but it can be a great danger to anyone who wants to practice scholarship, the life of the mind, and the life of faith. It creates an illusion of effortless achievement. One post, look what I did, erases weeks, sometimes years, of a, sometimes a lifetime of labor as a historian and a human being. You know, that toxic self-doubt that we never admit to, but everyone has around 3.30 in the afternoon in the library when you're si sitting uh, thinking, I could have become a river, ride, uh, river uh, raft guide or a venture capitalist, and here I am with all these dusty books uh, and is anyone ever going to read about what I'm doing? It's hard work. It, your social media post says nothing about how hard, how tiring it can be to force an idea out of your mind when, you know, for no discernible reason, you suddenly have the attention span of a chipmunk. In other words, it, it happens to all of us. In other words, social media posts erase everything that goes towards good intellectual work. You know, boredom is good for us. We have mounting piles of evidence now that social media is destroying our creativity by eroding our tolerance for tedium. It's hard for many people, uh, educated people, to read a challenging book from cover to cover. Uh, and certainly, of course, as we know, to unplug, to take a walk. Um, without uh, your iPhone or, or, you know, to sit uh, quietly without your laptop. But good writing and good history means working through the boredom, accepting the feeling of being the most clueless and dense person in the world uh, without any words that might explain what you know, working through it to the other side. Boredom is more than just good for psychological health. The spiritual practice of waiting, as we might call it, is a lost ritual with deep roots in our own Christian tradition, let alone many other faiths. I like the way Martin Buber, um, the, the Jewish uh, philosopher, says, uh, ideas are no more enthroned above our heads than resident in them. Uh, uh, he says, ideas wander around amongst us and accost us. You know, scholars like to talk a lot. Uh, and sometimes it just pays to stop talking and listen, to tend the garden, sometimes for a very long time. The temptations of distraction have become so powerful, even, I think, probably to the best minds if they would admit this. Uh, what kinds of disciplines are required of us today that our ancestors knew nothing about when they were sitting down with a quill pen or a typewriter? But, okay. Enough about hard work and responsibility. You did not come here to, to hear about hard work and responsibility alone. Um, historians are ultimately people of imagination. Think about it. Uh, we cannot see our subjects or talk to them. We will never live in their world. Um, and so we all the time create mental images of our subjects, uh, what their voice sounded like, how they might have felt reading that 
awful Dear John letter that we found in the archives. These, the people that we write about are invisible. They're forever mysterious. And so our work consists in finding, uh, feeling, filling those empty spaces with our own mental pictures. And so we are, you know, let's face it, not just crunchy facts. We are working with our imaginations in a way that a lot of fields don't have to. And so I think I would say this means that there is no excuse for dull, unimaginative scholarship uh, history, especially for those within a religious tradition. We of all people should be the most um, aware of the strange, the most open to the uncanny, to have a belief that some things really do matter, and they're probably not the things that we su suspect. Um, the philosopher William James, in 1895, he wrote this, uh, he gave this address, um, and who could not read it with this title? It was called, Is Life Worth Living? Wouldn't you want a philosopher to tell you the answer to that? It's actually a pretty interesting essay, and I, this is just a short quote for him. If this life be not a real fight in which something is eternally gained for the universe by success, it is no better than a game of private theatricals from which one may withdraw at will. In other words, if we're um, just playing at this, if life is just a game and we can opt in or opt out, if there's nothing really at stake, then why? Why are we doing He says, it feels like a real fight as if there were something really wild in the universe which we are needed to redeem for such a half-wild, half-saved universe our nature has adopted. So, you know, imagining the past is a mental and spiritual skill that used to be taken for granted. Um, people talked about their ancestors as if they were in the room with them. We do not have a cultural vocabulary for that now. We. Um, we don't, as historians, just have to give our subjects, you know, kind of three-dimensional life and breath. We have to convince people that they should care about them in the first place. Uh, uh, we are stuck, you know, with the cliche, um, well, uh, history is important because those who uh, forget the past are doomed to repeat it or some such thing. I thought, I, I would, who has ever, who has ever, um, you know, said, well, we better not do that. Yeah, we better not pass that law or, you know, do this action because, you know, what happened the last time there was a war? It didn't turn out so great. Oh, great. Thanks for reminding us. It never happens. Um, we don't know what to do with historians. I, you know, I particularly, everyone has their pet peeve, but mine's the historians on cable TV. They trot them out. Uh, and they put this poor guy in a suit. They sit him down and say, well, does any of what's going on today look familiar to you? And the guy, you know, like, well, some of it does, but a lot of it doesn't because it's different. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> who cares? Uh, so what? Um, many people today cannot, for the life of them, see why it should matter what some long dead person did or said. It's assumed that people in the past are not as smart, as morally complex, as self-aware as we believe ourselves to be today. And so we need to do history with um, an urgency, and I say an imaginative joy that will transform that way of thinking about the past, that profound indifference into curiosity and respect. You know, we're speaking for dead people. I mean, what other profession gets to do that? We can understand now perhaps better than any other generation, the bottomless anxiety that C.S. Lewis addressed in 1939, and this is a sermon that he gave in Oxford entitled, Learning in Wartime. He was um, giving this address to a group of young men who were prepared to, this is 1939, they were Oxford students, they were expecting to go into battle. They were father, they had, or he was speaking to fathers who would watch them leave, possibly for good. He was speaking to older men who knew full well the horrors that were in store for these young men in 1939. The Great War was barely over and Britain was gearing up again for privation and sacrifice, for rationing and long lines and unspeakable loss. At a time like this, what could be more self-indulgent, more foolish, than he, uh, reading ancient books, burying yourself in an archive, or as C.S. Lewis put the question, 
What is the use of beginning a task which we have so little chance of finishing? If, or if even if we ourselves should happen not to be interrupted by death or military service, why should we, how can we, continue to take an interest in what he calls the placid operations, you know, the scholarly work, when the lives of our friends and the liberties of Europe are in the balance? How can anybody sit in a library and write history when the world is going to hell in a handbasket, he would say. And so C.S. Lewis uh, found comfort in what he called the historical long view. He said, we need history more than ever now. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. He said, if our ancestors had postponed their search for knowledge and beauty until everything was all right, everything was secure, that search never would have happened, never would have begun. There's never been a time in history when, okay, good, now we can sit around and you know, think great thoughts. It's never been a good time for that. Most of all, um, C.S. Lewis said, we need intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, he said, but we need the past because it's all we've got. We can't study the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And we need something to help us measure the present, to set against the present, to remind us that what seems utterly certain today, he said, is merely temporary fashion. History is the one place that they're going to tell you it could be worse. It could be better. It will change. And nobody knows what's going to happen. He was not arguing for some kind of high-minded retreat from the real world, as if scholarship was some kind of holy end in itself. But he was clear that the times required more than a casual acquaintance with the past, you know, uh, as if history was just a hobby or a distraction, something for history buffs or people who like to reenact um, Civil War uh, battles in costume. Um, people on the brink of World War, he said, needed a thoughtful engagement with their ancestors. He said, an intimate knowledge of what has gone before. They needed to know that the future would be neither completely terrible nor wonderfully perfect, they, it, that it would be just as complicated and ineffable and frustrating and inconclusive as the past and the present. And so, uh, you know, kind of going back to where we started at my, at my school picnic, of being out of sync, of being willing to be wrong, or seeing things from a perspective that uh, you hadn't planned on. History does not give us certainty. That's not why we do it as people of faith. It may give us moments of inspiration. It may give us some shining examples of people who made it through hard times. Um, but it also throws out many stories of people who failed miserably, who fell victim to horror and despair. History's gift is what it allows us to see, our place within that kind of vast column of time. It's like a map. It decenters us. Uh, the most abrupt and uh, uh, mind-bending experience is realizing how many people have lived before you. Not just now, but before you. It's the truest way of knowing, as uh, uh, Lewis's contemporary, uh, a woman named Evelyn Underhill, wrote, our personal ups and downs, even the screaming newspaper headlines of the day, are small and transitory spiritual facts within a vast and abiding spiritual world. An intimate knowledge of the past opens us to not just the wealth of human experience, it's the closest um, she said, and I guess I would uh, uh, agree with her in closing, to a God's eye view of our world as it is now, um, as it was in it, as it may well become. So that's what I have to say. I hope that you have some thoughts or questions or comments. I'd be more than welcome to, you know, to, to hear what's been going on. <laughs> How many history majors in the room? You should ask between history and family history. Okay, so history and family history? A few more? Good for you.
I hope we got a few more today. Ooh, you have to come tomorrow, because I'm going to tell you how I ended up there, and uh, uh, that was kind of an upside-the-head experience myself. I uh, never thought I would ever end up doing that. Yeah, and I, as I was telling people at lunch, every day my job involves doing things I have no business doing, <laughs> but I just do them. Yeah, and, and they're none the wiser. So, so, I, so, so, so the talk that I'm giving tomorrow is really kind of helping you kind of reflect on what happened to me and the career choices that I made, because I was a professor of history, and I thought I really wanted to be one. But uh, <laughs> there are other things you can do. There, and and I, as I'm kind of saying today, you, and this is what I'll say tomorrow, you have an intellectual craft that you have learned as a history student. You have an ability to think in a particular way that is unusual, that you need to be aware of and proud of and make use of. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know if this was you or Lewis or under <laughs> that you said so history's gift is to decenter us. Mm -hmm. So would you mind giving an example of how that, as a person of faith, how, or just as a historian, a, you know, from a personal story or somebody you know, just sort of yeah. an example of how it decenters in a fruitful way, right? It kind of shatters the blocks and then. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, I can reflect, uh, you know, a little bit of my biography. I grew up um, in a Dutch Calvinist subculture. And um, I said I was not a Girl Scout, I was actually a Calvinette. Uh, and so everybody I knew was Dutch, uh, everybody loved John Calvin, um, and I thought that that's what the whole world was like. Um, or if they weren't, they just weren't as smart as we were. I mean, I honestly, they just hadn't figured it out yet, but they would. And so, um, History was a shock, you know, to get the lay of the land and realize that <laughs> the first re realization for me was that John Calvin wasn't Dutch, he was French. It was like, I was 20 before I figured that one out. Um, but that, um, you know, that history presents you with this incredible human panorama of other, not just other countries, but years and centuries of people who have lived before you, and you think you know you've got it going on? I mean, I, you know, it, it, in some ways it was a tremendously, you know, I think uh, in college you have this dark night of the soul. It's like, oh, I am such a little speck, why do I even bother? But yet there's some comfort in knowing that there, that's where I am on the map. That's where I am on the map, and my place matters. I mean, it decenters and then it centers you. Yeah. So we are uh, looking at redoing our GE here at BYU. And I'm wondering what would you suggest as a place of history in yeah. education? Yeah, well, you know, I would say that everyone has to have some. I mean, I. <laughs> Because I, you know, I the school where I was teaching, they I quite honestly got rid of that requirement. Uh, history is part of the distribution, and that meant that the history department itself, institutionally, was much smaller. Um, you know, I, 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 I just think that history is so humbling. It's some of the most humbling work that you can do to realize that. Not only, you know, that every person who has ever made a prediction about the past is wrong. <laughs> you know, that other people have um, thought great things. It's very humbling to, um, to think about, you know, to read someone else's brilliant, you know, work or maybe not so brilliant and realize you're never going to have a chance to talk to them, that you have to work. With, I mean, I just... If, you know, I, I, well, I will also point out that, um, you know, I was, I, I reread 1984. Everybody needs to do that, um, even though we're way past 1984. And if you re haven't read that book, it's a book about history, studying history, because, uh, was it Winston Smith or whoever, his 
job at this, you know, hideous futuristic bureaucracy was literally going through the newspaper headlines and obliterating anything that was unflattering to the people in power. And he and that phrase down the memory hole that comes from that book. He would literally had a shoot next to his desk where those things were forgotten. Um, and to me, you know, it's like that is so terrifying that to think that people, when they manipulate the past or tell us that's not what happened, I mean, and then, you know, the other example is that, you know, people who have successfully resisted, um, you know, and voices for themselves, people from native cultures, you know, African Americans, what is it all about? It's about history, about recovering their past that gives them, you know, that sense of this is who we are and this is what we believe in. It's not about just dis disembodied ideas. It's, um, I, I, you know, I'm all over the place with that question because it's just, I think it's not just, you know, let's have a well-furnished mind. I think for these times when so little history is being taught in high school, you know, people don't know. They don't know, they don't know. And they don't know that they don't know. You know, I, it's, to me, it's just kind of culturally perilous. So, sir? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, things like, um, I mean, I could go on and on about this, but like, even really horrible people in their history, such as Mao Zedong, are venerated as great heroes and, and leaders. How do you take something that's horrible about the past, that's dear to a certain culture, mm -hmm. and like, how do you help softly break that perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in Boston, you know, where I live, we got a lot of history. Um, and this conversation, a version of what you're talking about, is happening all the time. And, you know, you Confederate statues and everything, Faneuil Hall, where every tourist wants to go, uh, um, for reasons I escape me. But it's, uh, it was, uh, it's called Faneuil Hall because it was um, money donated by this guy, Peter Faneuil, in the 18th century. Well, lo and behold, he owned slaves. You could have slaves in Massachusetts in the 18th century. So now let's let's rename it. Let's get rid of Peter Faneuil. Um, you know, let's uh, let's you know write the record. You know, he was a horrible person. Um, and you know, that's a really difficult conversation to have. I was listening to um, a radio. Um, you know, you know, one of these NPR things. I was in the car. I had nothing else to do. But it, it turned out to be fascinating. And it was about a, um, and by an artist who lived in New York and was he was um, African American and it just distressed him no end. Every time he walked into the New York Public Library, there was um, a, a horse, you know, statue of Teddy Roosevelt on a horse, and apparently to either side, a Native American and an African American, you know, like oh, thank you for saving us. You know, it's, it's really inappropriate. It's hurtful. And so people get, let's get rid of this, let's get rid of it. Um, what he said is, no, what you need is another statue right next to it of an African-American on a horse that will force Theodore Roosevelt to explain himself, you know? <laughs> Put those things in dialogue. Rather than obliterating and tearing down things, you know, let's explain it. I saw um, an ex a wonderful example of, um, it was one of these, um, paintings or dioramas of some native village. And it was, you know, hideously, awfully wrong. Like, it was the middle of winter and the Indians were wearing loincloths or like, oh, they just wouldn't have done that. I mean, so instead of tearing it down, they wrote on the glass in front of this exhibit everything that, you know, was wrong and then said this is what really would have happened. Now, you know, you didn't have to do violence to what, uh, you know, s another generation, several generations ago thought was history. You don't have to do violence or obliterate it, but you can force it to explain itself, you know, and people will learn more about what actually happened because it's there, but you'd have to do it 
Right. I mean, we have that freedom to do that in our culture. I can't speak for China. But, you know, we are, you know, having all these kinds of conversations. I'm very aware. Um, next year um, is 2020, you know, the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims. So for the library I work at, that's like Christmas and New Year's and Halloween and everything uh, uh, rolled into one. Um, but yet, you know, Native Americans are kind of, as I was told, told Amy, uh, waiting for 2021 when it's all over. You know, so how do we talk about this in a way that I say is historically responsible? We're not lionizing people. We're not looking for the dirt on them. We want to tell the story and then challenge people to say, how does that affect the way that I see the present? It's a long answer to an unanswerable question that you just asked, but it's, it's a wonderful question. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert, but I read Colleen McDaniel's recent book, and I just adored that book. I mean, just not because she, it beca I, and I don't know what you folks think, but I felt like um, she did not have an axe to grind. She was not trying to shame anybody. Um, she was just being historically responsible. This is what happened. And, you know, some people are going to disagree with some things, others, but they were people struggling through their times with, you know, with, the, with doing the best they could with what they had. So, you know, I, I found that um, a wonderful read. I, yeah, I should tell What's the name of her book? Sister Saints? Sister Saints. Sister Saints. She's up at the U. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, am a, I am a congregationalist. I'm a pastor's wife. I am a, a New England Yankee Congregationalist so, and a minister's wife, which is even worse. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, I am um, no longer a uh, Calvinat, but I'm. Of course, the pity. Yeah, <laughs> in at, in heart, I am. Yeah, one always is. Getting one last question. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it.